Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Where, <laughs> Welcome. Where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Evie Cincy's August edition of Eve Room Zooms. I'm Carla Walker, the climate advisor for the city of Cincinnati. We're doing, uh, and I'm doing an homage to our guests this afternoon, Trey Wusti, the vice president of our locally based uh, Beachmont Auto Group, and he is also the vice president of the Greater Cincinnati Automobile Dealers Association, along with Martin Lee, host of the international podcast EV, New EV News Daily. Welcome, guys. How you guys doing? Yeah, pretty really good. Great, thanks. Okay. Great. I am also happy to be joined by Liz Reichart out there in the audience. She is our former Environmental Defense Fellow, Fund Fellow for Cincinnati's Office of Environment and Sustainability. Hey, Liz. Um, just a shout out to our repeat room Zoomers. You guys know the ropes here, so indulge me just a bit while I walk our newbies through. We connect, um, our EVRU Zooms are monthly conversations on various EV topics. We connect the Cincinnati public with movers and shakers in the EV world, primarily in Cincinnati and across Southwest Ohio. But as you can tell from our um, guests today, we are more than happy to expand that circle. As climate advisor, I support the city of Cincinnati's Office of Environment and, uh, and Sustainability on a number of climate change initiatives through the American Cities Climate Challenge. That includes helping to uh, advance Cincinnati's electrification strategy. EV Cincy is our public outreach and education initiative to build awareness around the benefits of EVs and EV activities happening in and around Cincinnati. So a couple of things to note about this event um, and these kinds of events. These are uh, a mashup, if you will, of a webinar, a Zoom meeting, and a podcast. So while there will be a PowerPoint presentation, we want to make sure that we are engaging you as an audience. So we ask that if you can, make sure your video is switched on. Um, please, please, and please again, drop your questions and comments into the chat box. Um, following Trey and Martin's presentation, we're going to open it up to a full Q&A. Um, we'll be calling on you guys to uh, ask, and ask your questions. While we definitely want to have a lively exchange, we also want to make sure that you can hear us. So please be kind, mute your microphones when you're not speaking to block out any of the background noise. I'm going to unshare my screen so we can get started. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Trey and Martin. And please join me in giving a warm round uh, welcome and applause to Trey and Martin. Take it away, you guys. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Definitely excited to be here and, and super honored to be asked. So thank you, Carla. Thanks for putting this on and everything you guys do. It's, it's pretty awesome. And getting the word out there about EVs and including the, the local dealers is, is fantastic. And Martin, all the way across the ocean, uh, thank you so much for all the time you've helped us with. Uh, if, for those of you that don't know, Martin's podcast is awesome. I've listened to every episode. Uh, he has forgotten more things about EVs than we will ever learn or know. So thank you for being here and uh, thanks, for, thanks for taking part. Um, I'll share my screen. I really don't want to bore you with the PowerPoint. That's really not who I am. I've sat through enough presentations from, you know, factories and school and, and everything else to know that people do not engage with PowerPoint presentations. So I just thought a little, little bit about us, uh, a little bit about the cars that we offer that are um, either full battery electric or a plug-in hybrid variants and what's kind of coming down the pike just to see uh, where if something fits your needs, we'd, we'd love to help you with that. Uh, but I'll, I'll share my PowerPoint real quick and get it out of the way so that we don't have to be uh, bothered with the PowerPoint anymore. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. Let's see here. It's my first uh, lead of a Zoom call. So I apologize if, I, uh, if I'm moving around or whatnot. It's, uh, it's a, new, a new thing. We're normally face to face with all the people that come through our doors. So a little easy. Um, so just a little bit about us. We've been in business over 40 years. Uh, my dad started it when he was 20 years old. It, it's an amazing company to work for. We employ about 370 people and 
it's amazing to see everybody come in every day doing theoretically the same job but having multi multi multiple different interactions with the same or different people every day and my dad makes it an awesome environment for us uh he's the most anti-car guy car guy that you could ever find while he loves it he is not you know let's make this deal let's do this he's he's very laid back and it it's a really enjoyable place for everyone to work um last year we retailed about 6300 cars uh, we have eight total dealerships and 16 ancillary businesses total um, around. We've got a couple car washes. I'll show you right here on the next slide what we have going on. So these are our dealerships um, and car washes and body shops. And we even sell lawnmowers. So we actually have a pretty awesome selection of electric lawnmowers. That was a little surprise sneak peek of what I've, I've got for you later. But uh, we kind of run the gamut. We've got Toyota and Honda are our volume stores. Um, Volvo, Audi, Alfa Romeo, kind of in between, and uh, Maserati and Porsche on the on the high end that really make for an awesome portfolio for us. Uh, we also have a traditional body shop. We do uh, some automotive storage, and we also have a, a Porsche restoration shop that's been a pretty cool addition over the last couple of years. Uh, the car washes also add for a really nice you know, compliment for our customers. A lot of our stores, if you purchase a vehicle, you get free car washes either for a year or for as long as you own your car, depending on the brand. So been an awesome, awesome thing for us to have. Um, you know, some myths I think we'd like to dispel. Uh, Martin on his show has talked a couple times about the Sierra Club and that dealers don't want to sell electric cars. Total lie. We will sell you whatever. It is, it doesn't matter if it's powered by gas, diesel, rocket fuel, and electricity, it doesn't matter to us. We just want to sell what the customers want. So any, anywhere that you can have a great interaction with a dealer, you know, you, I think a lot of people have had their uh, interactions with a dealer frozen between like 1975 and 1985 with plaid jackets and a four square chart. So if we're able to, you know, make it more customer friendly, we're doing everything in our possible power right now to do that. And I think that moving on uh, with this, presentation, we'll get into a little bit of discussion that we had earlier about some of the things that we're doing that really are exciting for our customers. Um, we actually have heard randomly that employees of, of uh, automotive manufacturers are afraid to drive cars. We heard on a call that the North American head of, of one of the larger automotive manufacturers had to call people into his office to get them to drive an electric car when they had some at port. So it's not just a consumer facing thing or a dealer facing thing. It's a person facing thing. And people just don't know how it fits into their lives yet. And, and that's something that we're here to help you. Obviously you guys on this podcast probably already know, but we're here to help the average consumer figure out and learn about electric vehicles and, and make sure they can fit into their lives. And, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of different things out there that, that dealers could do better. And I think what we need to do that is we need to ask questions of you. So I implore you, please put in the comments for later. A part of the biggest motivator for us to get on this call was to learn what facts and, and figures and whatnot we can present to our customers that make it a much better buying experience. We, we don't know everything that, that people think are important about electric vehicles. We aren't sure exactly how you'd like it to be presented if it's just range if it's kilowatt hours if it's everything if there are things that we're not doing now that we could be doing that would be better please please let me know because we'd love to tailor this experience it's new for all of us and we're working really hard right now in in developing our strategy and obviously it is different than a typical consumer uh these cars are all different and it's awesome so we're happy to learn and and everything else so Again, I just thought we'd quickly go through um, each dealership and what they offer. So I, I don't want to spend more than one or two minutes on any of these different slides. But if you see something that's exciting, you want to ask a question, please feel free. Uh, I don't know anything about horsepower or torque or anything like that. But I know plenty of people, probably about 150 of them, that can tell you everything that you need to know uh, about it. So I'm a, I'm a good guy of taking a note and coming back to you. But I do know that they all look good and they drive awesome. So Behind me, you can see uh, this is a 2019 e-tron. This is actually our last one that we have in stock. We are waiting, waiting, waiting uh, for the 2020 e-tron Sportback to get here. Um, we also are unsure exactly when the e-tron GT is going to be here. Um, and the, the Q4 e-tron, you've seen, the, I, I've actually seen the concept car. A beautiful. I mean, one of the coolest looking cars I've ever seen. And if you haven't checked it out, Google it. 
uh, it, it looks spectacular. And, and I hope the production model looks exactly like that when it comes out. It's going to be an unbelievable price point. I think I've heard mid 40s, which would be fantastic, especially with the tax credit on top of that price. So um, Audi also is launching a bunch of plug-in hybrids that are, are out now or do out soon. Uh, we have the Q5e, which is out in stores, the A8e, which is in stores, and the A7, which will be here hopefully by the end of the year. I know with the, the virus, everything's kind of been pushed back and delayed in time frames. So um, all, all will be awesome cars and, and provide a pretty significant portion of range. I, I want to say over 30 miles for each one, which you know, on a daily commute is, is pretty amazing. So uh, you should be able to get to and from work depending on your drive uh, pretty easily. Um, you know, the, your biggest problem is going to be making sure that the gas doesn't go bad in a lot of these cars. Um, Porsche, which is my, my personal favorite right now. I drove a Taycan the other day. Uh, we just got our first four S's in and man, they are spectacular. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, we've seen a lot of pre-orders for turbo and turbo S's and and we pretty much sold almost everything that's coming in. It's it's an awesome car and well, 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 well worth it. So I know there's also been rumors of the, the new Macan, uh, the next generation Macan, which is a few years out, but worth mentioning. Um, currently right now, the, the plug-in Cayenne is a fantastic car and the plug-in Panamera also. Um, they, they came out with the, the new version of the Panamera with the Turbo SE hybrid and man, that's the perfect way to use the electric as like a boost. Just give it a little bit more horsepower. It's super fast and fun, but adding that a little electric boost is is really great. So um, just a couple extra pictures, just some around town. We had a, one of our social media people took that photo with the Cincinnati Skyline, and that's actually our sales manager's uh, plug-in hybrid tie-in right there, plug in in front of our dealership. And then the 918, I mean, you know, it's hard not to do something and talk about the 918. I would say Taycan is number two coolest car I've ever driven. 918, number one, hands down. It's, it's great. So while it, while it only gets whatever, 17 miles of electric power, that, that boost is really used well. Um, moving along to one of our most exciting brands right now, Volvo obviously has made a lot of electrification promises. And, you know, right now they're really coming to fruition. Um, they just announced the XC40 Recharge. We're really excited about this car. Uh, the XC40 was a great seller for us when it first came out and still is. And I think the size and the shape is just perfect. Um, they also have T8 uh, E all wheel drive versions of, of a number of their vehicles. Uh, just recently uh, in the 2021 model year, they announced that all of the difference from MSRP of, the, uh, of each brand will be less if you go up to a plug-in hybrid um, when you when you factor in the tax credit, so you're you're essentially getting the same car for a little bit less when you factor in the, the tax credit, which is a great thing, you know, for consumers who are just dipping their toe in the electric waters. That's a bad that's a bad reference with electricity, so I apologize for that one. But Toyota um, right now uh, mainly plug-in hybrid. Uh, we had the Prius Prime, and the Prius family has been just fantastic. One of the one of the first people in Martin's a little you know negged sometimes on it but uh we we love toyota here and, and we think everything that they're doing is is great for us uh the rav4 prime we've seen unprecedented demand for a new toyota like this i mean it's it's really spectacular um and the mirai which my dad and i were lucky enough to see um at the dealer meeting last year it's not really sold in our market yet just based on hydrogen infrastructure but man this new model looks fantastic if they ever bring it here I, I do think it'll be a great seller with the with the plug-in hybrid there it's it's pretty awesome um maserati and alfa romeo both are just kind of making everything basically electrified in some capacity so it's kind of exciting to see there's there's been some of the all the next generation stuff is coming out plus they'll offer the same model in electric plug-in hybrid and and regular gasoline engine at the same time which that's that's going to be a really cool thing to to test and see what what people go for and, and how much that power of the electric versus the regular gasoline engine what uh, what consumers think and, and what they really want so Maserati right now for mayo in the next couple of years you'll see a lot of hybrid and electrified cars coming coming through which 
which will be great for the brand and, and hopefully bring a few new buyers to, uh, to these awesome storied Italian lines. Um, and that go to Honda. So Honda, the clarity is, is really the family now that they have their plugins. They have a CRV hybrid, which is not yet a plugin, but we're hoping, hoping, hoping that they'll come back out with it. Um, the clarities have been great. Uh, there is some availability. They've been uh, obviously mainly focused on the West coast, especially with the hydrogen fuel cell again. Uh, but we, we have sold several of them to a lot of customers in town that, that are pretty, you know, interested and excited about them. Uh, and finally, this is my little, my, my little hidden Easter egg here. Uh, we have two sets of electric mowers through our Honda store. Uh, the one on the left, more traditional mower, um, Ego, a new brand. You won't find it on our website. It's not necessarily Honda compliant. Uh, it's a new brand we picked up, just kind of works with our portfolio. And on the right is one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I moved last year and unfortunately had to give it up. But uh, the Honda Mimo is an electric, like Roomba lawnmower. And it is really one of the coolest things ever. I had a, a yard in the city of Cincinnati. It was about one-tenth of an acre. And it would mow it all night long. And my, my yard would be perfectly kept except for the border of the electric fence around it. And then I'd have to take a little weed whacker and go around for five minutes and cut it. But it is so cool and so funny. If you have a yard that works, you know, please let us know. We'd love to, we'd love to show you what it can do. Uh, if you drive up and down Beach Run Avenue by our Honda store, uh, you will see one every now and then just driving around on the, on the little grass strip in front of the dealership. So Again, questions, would love to help. I mean, I throw these back up there. We'd, we'd love to hear what you need from us to, to learn more about EVs or, or switch to a you know, mainstream, luck, or uh, what is it? What, what do you always call them, Martin? Uh, legacy OEMs. So we'd love to, we'd love to see you. We'd love to help you. Um, here's our website. You can check out a lot of our stuff. So with that, you know, I, will, uh, I will take off the PowerPoint and go back to the real star uh, of, with Martin and Carla here. Um, Trey, thank you so much. Um, that was that was great. Thank you also for not wearing a plaid jacket. I really appreciate not seeing that. Um, yeah, well, you, I left it in my office. That's why I'm in the, just the, the shirt. <laughs> um, so I want to uh, bring Martin in here. And I usually start off all of our Q&A uh, sessions with uh, a question that I ask everyone. Um, Thanks also for the folks uh, attending, for dropping those questions in the chat. Keep them coming. We'll get to those in just a second. But let's start everything off with my typical question to both of you guys. How did you guys get interested in EVs to begin with? You want me to take this one first, Trey? Go okay. Ahead. Go, go right ahead. Sorry. I'll, I'll dive in with this. So my experience was one of owning a uh, Volkswagen uh, my second Golf that I was owning at the time when Dieselgate happened. Now, different laws in different countries meant that actually we didn't have the laws, whereas for our US viewers and listeners, uh, VW had to pay a big price. And, you know, out the back of that, if we're looking for silver linings, we have things like Electrify America, and it really sped up their focus on, on EVs. So we try and find the positives in that. But clearly, they broke some rules in the US. Over here, it didn't that we didn't really write the rules for them to break. So rather than, uh, and it's in the courts right now, so I'll be careful what, what I say because there's some other things happening. But, um, but when that happened, all they had to do was make it right. So I got the call uh, from my, my VW dealer to say, you got to, your car's got to come back and explain why. And it's because they had some software because they'd been doing some, some things with the emissions. And that's what ironically made me think, what do you mean? something wrong. I just thought I was driving this, this very clean diesel car. It's clean diesel, right? Uh, that's a thing. And then I just got interested and I realized that actually, no, if we're burning anything, it's not great. Now, no one's going to click their fingers and we're not going to go zero emissions overnight. Not going to happen. And, uh, and I think there's a, a great future for combustion, whether it's in racing or we have weekend cars or we keep classic cars on the road or we convert some classic cars and we keep others running on fossil fuels. And, and I, you know, I'm not advocating that all of a sudden we've got to go around hugging trees. But that's what got me interested. Uh, and I started finding kind of YouTube channels and trying to learn more. But there really wasn't a lot out there at the time. We're going back uh, many years now. So uh, that's, that was the start of my journey and ended up starting a Twitter account and tweeting about the cool things that I found about uh, EVs. And then, uh, and then thinking, well, I'm boring my wife talking about this all the time. And she was delighted when I said, I'm going to go to the bottom of the garden to the shed 
where I am. It's a fancy shed. Uh, and I'm going to make a podcast about EVs. Nobody will listen, but at least I'll talk about EVs and I'll give her five minutes peace. And well, it turned out a few people were interested in listening and it's been uh, a heck of a journey. And, uh, and now that's where I've, I've got to where I am. And I can just, I'm just looking at the group chat on the side of my screen. It's going, it's going wild. So thank you so much. Uh, keep those comments coming in. If you are new to Zoom, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a little chat icon. You can click that and you can leave a question. Um, and if you'd rather just write a few words rather than uh, put your hand up and say something you know, in, in, in person, please do that. And, and we're going to get to all these, these questions, these comments, these discussion points as well. Uh, I know that if you're new to Zoom, uh, you might want to uh, uh, just to have a little look, look around and in a minute, we'll get to those, those questions. And for now, uh, stay on mute uh, until, until that time. That's my, that's my story. How about you, Trey? Well, again, I've, I've got to give credit uh, where credit's due. So my dad, when we were growing up, he'd always, you know, I was a, a 911 guy that's that's what it is it was only that and that was my that was the halo car right and so um you know but my dad would would imp have one of his friends that was a dealer somewhere else uh like, like import him in a plug-in one of the first plug-in hybrid priuses uh you know 10 years ago maybe even longer 12 years ago before they were really nationwide when they were you could only sell them in California and they had to be returned to California so he did that he drove one of the first plug-in Panameras um, you know, one of the first plug-in Cayennes. Uh, so, you know, really it, it was always around me and, and really it was the 918 that got me first interested. Uh, the first time I ever was in love with a plug-in hybrid car. So it started there. I dipped my toe in it and, and, you know, driving the Taycan now and my dad's e-tron, it is, it, it, it's a different world. I mean, there's nothing, you can't argue with, the power and instant delivery. Now I just do miss the stick shift. I'm a stick shift guy. So I've seen some of the resto mods that have uh, a couple gears and hopefully a clutch that you can put an electric engine in. Uh, so that's, that's, that's where I'm going to be living, I think. But, uh, but I, I, on a daily drive, there's, there's nothing better than that. If I can ask, uh, ask our first question to get, to get the ball rolling, and that is really about where we, where we will, what that interaction is going to be with the people that sell us cars in the future, Trey. So, you know, I've got my, you know, I've got my phone here. I'll hold it up to the camera for those. That's a picture of my son wearing sunglasses, looking very <laughs> cool for those watching the screen. Uh, I didn't, didn't intend to show you that. But, um, uh, but um, uh, for, for those... Uh, people like me who who like to buy things online like my telephone that I was just holding up I'll research that I'll watch YouTube videos I'll do my own research and when I'm ready to go I'll hit buy right I don't want to be I don't want to go around mobile phone shops I don't want to be talking to going up and down the high street and looking at I'm gonna I want to look at everything online and then I'll make a decision and then maybe I'll need some help at some point now I think Elon Musk we haven't mentioned Tesla really yet and and we're pretty good we're 23 minutes in and we haven't mentioned him. Um I think he's done a really good job at positioning their way of doing business as as the only way. Like if you go back to the late 1970s, IBM was the only game in town with computers, right? That was the name attached. And so I think fast forward 40 years, I think you say EVs, many people will say Tesla and Elon. He has a huge public profile saying rockets into space. And he's doing a good job with, with, with that brand, but he makes a big deal of, well, you can buy our cars online. I think that captures people's imaginations. Well, Trey, you have a big car business. Do you sell cars online? Uh, right now, you can do everything with one of our dealership websites that you can do with Tesla. We, we have the ability now uh, to, for you to go on there, select something from our inventory, and buy that car. And you can, you can pre-apply for credit. You can get all your documents that are needed and send them to us all online. And we can print the paperwork and we can be ready for a 15 minute signing delivery when you come in. And if you don't even wanna come in, we can FedEx that paperwork to your home and, and have you complete the transaction totally 100% remotely. We could deliver that car to your door. We could have someone call you over Zoom and go through the features, set up the car. So I, I do think that there's a loose term of buying because there is a lot of federal regulated paperwork that even Tesla buyers have to fill out that still requires some sort of time and process. But yes, you are able to at two in the morning, sit on the couch in your underwear, buy one of our cars and, and we'll get it set up for you. I love that. I love that. But as a, as, a, as a counterpoint, I knew even before I drove one that I wanted to buy an EV. But my wife, who has a different relationship with cars, for her, they're very utilitarian. So the car does a job. 
for her. And she doesn't didn't really mind if it was petrol, diesel, electric, whatever. It was a means to an end for her. I, I enjoy the I enjoy driving and she doesn't. So when I was talking about buying an electric car, she couldn't quite understand why we needed to do that. And she humored me for a while, but she wasn't really on board until I persuaded her to our local dealership and she drove one. Now again, because she doesn't get any enjoyment out of clutch bite points and things like that like you know so that that she she was frustrated with with cars they were too complicated for her and all of a sudden okay forwards backwards it's quiet and every morning i get in and it's going to be full i never have to go to the petrol station again sign me up she said so uh, so whilst it's nice that we can do everything online you know and i and i probably would but how typical would something like my wife's experience be where she wanted to go to a dealership and she wanted to have that that more visceral physical experience trey how do you how do you balance those things out uh i mean martin you know there's a lot of splash and 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 rush to the online sales and and having all these things physically present on the website for you to go through and purchase but you know even now the vast majority of our customers choose to come in. Uh, it, it is the second biggest purchase that most people make, whether or not you purchase it with cash or finance or lease it, it's a very scary number that you see on the paper, no matter what you're buying in most cases. So being able to feel 100% totally comfortable with it and drive it for an extended period of time it, and drive it multiple times if need be and physically touch, feel, sit, because sometimes if you're tall or short, you may not have the right thing. The seats are different. I mean. There's a number of things that we still find our people coming and doing, and and the model of buying a car, you know, at at online without even talking to a dealer. I mean, you may not know some of the options. It, you know, what do you do with your car? I, I think I think a lot of other places tell you to just sell it at CarMax or whatnot, but you know, that's something that we we really like to purchase from you, and we buy all sorts of cars, whether they're electric, gasoline, uh, towed in on a tow truck. We'll buy it. So it's one of those things that that our customers still overwhelmingly choose to come in but it's one of the one of the other things that we've been able to do for a number of years even without the fancy technology on our website but we just got to get that message out to our customers i'd like to see more comments in the chat as well from people about just their personal take on do you want to buy stuff online do you want to do you want a physical do you want to have a hybrid uh thing thing of both you know i think that there probably is a lot of people and i'd be interested to try on on your take on this from from a lot of people there's a generational thing. So some of our viewers and listeners right now who can remember the days of, you know, going to buy a car and it was a slimy, greasy uh, salesman and you had to take a friend or a trusted buddy who was maybe even a mechanic that would get underneath the car and check there was no oil leaks. And, you know, if they put some sawdust in the gearbox just to get it out of the, out of the garage. Well, you know, EVs now are, you can't really service them at home. You definitely can't service them at home. And also, they're a different kind of technology. They're more akin to a mobile phone. So very few moving parts. And you don't need to ask that question of how does it run? Because if it's running, it's probably running perfectly. And if it's not, it's a major issue. And it's not the work of a moment. You know, if the battery's failed, you can't just pop a new one in. So um, that, that's got to go back to the dealer to be, to be sorted out. So, you know, there's a younger audience as well. I would say people in the kind of 20s, maybe the Uber generation who who are you know they're kind of they're, they subscribe to netflix and spotify they don't own cars they get ubers everywhere and stuff and they're, they're, they've never lived through that that uh, that time of of car dealerships so they know something a whole different world so how do you find that that difference in terms of people coming in interested in evs and w what do they expect to find because there's very little technically to go wrong with them and if it does go wrong like i say it's a it's it's kind of let's get it fixed kind of issue it's not from combustion engines there's it's such a such a difference right oh uh, definitely and i mean to unpack what you said i mean there's a lot in there um I, you know i think the first and foremost the the slimy where you don't really know what's going on i mean we price all of our new and used cars to market and we look at it on a daily basis i mean it's amazing how much and how much information the average consumer has, let alone you know what we see as a, as as what another car sold at. You know, hey, we we don't want these cars. We want to sell them, so we're not looking to hold on to them. You know, we we own them all, so it's not like Audi came and dumped them on our lot and said, okay, hey, sell this for us. We own them, so we want to sell them as quickly as we possibly can and get some more in. So, it just in that regard, I mean, 
there are obviously incentives that some people qualify for and some don't. So it does seem confusing. I, I mean, I think even similar to Tesla changing prices, you know, on a weekly basis, sometimes it, it all happens and it, it happens for a variety of reasons. So just know to do your research ahead of time. And if you know an, a similar transaction price, I mean, we're going to get you as close to that transaction price as we possibly can. So, uh, you know, I, I think that we're not here to, to run a museum. So we, we want to, we want to make sure that our customers are happy so that they do keep coming back for the second part of your question. You know, we want, we want you in our ecosystem. We want to give you car washes. We want you to buy ice cream at our car wash where we have an ice cream store. We, we want you to keep coming back to us when you need a new vehicle. You know, your electric car will run for a long time and your battery will last for a long time. But as you said, things happen, things fail. People just want new things. Technology changes so quickly today that people are coming back to market quicker. Um, and, and we want to be here and we want to be the first place that you think about. So anything that we can do, uh, we'll give you a full multi-point inspection free of charge every time anyone comes in. So, I mean, obviously it's a different multi-point inspection on an electric vehicle than it is on a gasoline um, ice car, but we're, we're going to make it as friendly and easy and transparent of a process as possible. So. Cool. Great that cool. you guys are answering these questions because there's a couple of questions that have come in through the chat and one or two that came in prior to the start of the event about the transition of the business model for dealerships kind of working now in this EV space. Um, a lot of folks have a lot of questions about so because there isn't that maintenance for um, EVs, how are uh, dealerships kind of gonna make their profit? So it's really great to hear you, Trey, talk about some of the other services that you all are providing there. Um, I know that we got a question in early from um, Marty Young, who I think I see on the call now, more specifically about that. Hey, Marty. Um, asking how that uh, traditional dealership model can be viable with what he believes is gonna be something akin to almost a 50% reduction in the um, loss of your gross uh, profits. Um, Marty, did they answer your question? And there's a couple more people who are asking something similar. I would prefer to hear a little bit more detail on that. And specifically what I was referring to, Trey, was something from the National Automobile Dealers Association, where they said that roughly, uh, just to, I guess, make it, put this quickly, 26% of dealer gross profits are from new vehicle sales. 25% are from used vehicle sales. Uh, almost 50%, 49.6, comes from parts and service. Electric vehicles have drastically fewer parts and require almost no service. So how will that traditional dealership model survive this transition to EVs? Great. Thanks, Marty. We're definitely, obviously, thinking about the future. And, and, and we've been trying really hard to integrate ourselves with local partners like electricians that we trust that we can send to your house to help you install chargers and whatnot and, and look at some of the ancillary businesses around it. But I mean, realistically, it's like going to the doctor. Uh, while your car can update itself over the Wi-Fi and, and whatnot, you, you know, you still would like to have someone get in there to make sure before, like Martin said, something catastrophic happens because it's a lot harder to, to, to move or go anywhere when, you're, when your car just completely dies. So I do think that there will be some sort of mainstream dealer maintenance interval uh but it's definitely something that we look at and, and are concerned of I and mean, i think you know tesla certainly doesn't lose money on the cars that it sells so i think if, if you know it's a it's a business and i think manufacturers make money we'll, it, we'll figure out ways that we can to make money and make make sure that the experience with the customer is still a good one yeah i i would i would add to that that it's actually a, a really important part of the buying decision in places outside of California, say, or outside of where there are uh, Tesla service centers close by. You know, both of mine, where I am on the south coast of the UK, I'm two hours away. And I mention this on the podcast and say, well, I'd, I'd love, I'd love a Tesla. But one of the things that genuinely holds me back is I'm two hours away from where it gets fixed. And then people email me, but they'll come to you. Like, oh, okay, right. It, it, is that in the UK already? Like, I didn't know that. And then but even so, put it on a truck, get it back there. Like, yeah, but I, my electric car dealer is five minutes down the road that way. And it's, there's, it's like a, an insurance policy. You hope you'll never need it. But think it, all machines are going to go wrong. Same with Polestar. Like, so uh, here in Europe, 
it's uh, the Volvo dealerships are going to be getting involved. I saw some pictures today in, in uh, I think, Norway of the, the Volvo dealership handing over the Polestar, right? So that's great. I have a Volvo dealer near me, but in the US, it's different with different rules. So now Polestar, I've got to build out a network. But if you're not with 150 miles of them, they're not going to cover the cost. So it's a very, it is a, a serious consideration when you're making the second biggest purchase in your life, a, apart from a house for most people, of where does it go when it goes wrong? And simply saying it's never going to go wrong is, 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 is kind of a typical Twitter answer. And I've been, I've said that before as well and say, well, you know, it's EVs are very reliable, but when they do go wrong, you, you just want to get it fixed as, as, as easily as possible. So um, I'm certainly interested in, in that at the minute, that next phase of the adoption curve. I think we've gone through the first phase of people who don't mind the inconvenience. Like people who are happy to be beta testers of EVs. And I think we are somewhere in the middle of coming out of that first phase or 1A and getting into phase 1B of people who, who just need a little bit more reassurance. And then there's going to be the mainstream over the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to kind of add on, I mean, one thing I shied away from, I mean, obviously every manufacturer has recalls. Uh, and, you know, I think early on recalls, especially from Tesla were handled on an individual basis versus one of the legacy OEMs, which would recall an entire series of cars. So I, I think with the advent of regulation and whatnot coming through there, there's always going to be a recall, whether it's a clip, a bolt, a something. And, and I mean, I, I do find that there, there's still going to be cases for us to be able to do your service. I mean, it's not going to be fun if, at seven in the morning, the tire shops are open. You know, we will be. We're there. We are, some of our stores are open until eleven o'clock at night. So we're we're there for our customers, and we we think that we've put in a lot of time and, and face in our community. And we we'd like to hope that our customers think of us first when it comes to every little thing about their car. Um, you know, dents, dings, scratches, whatever it is, we're we're happy to help. Yeah. Uh, Denise in the comments says, I found dealers that I've spoken to, says Denise uh, Mustaine, uh, say that people don't bring up how the dealers don't bring up how an EV is good for the environment, nor do some of the salesmen know how important it is that EVs are charged with wind and solar and hydropower. It seems to be the missing link, says um, uh, yeah. Denise. Yeah. I, can, you know, I, can talk to, I can talk to that because the first EV that we bought, um, I didn't tell the gentleman that I knew a lot about it. I didn't intentionally play dumb. I wasn't trying to con anybody, but you know, I certainly didn't say that I did a podcast every day about electric cars, you know, and I'd signed the agreement, you know, and it handed over the keys and we're doing the niceties. Thank you for the coffee. And he said, Hey, by the way, how are you charging it? And I thought at the time, this is broken. Like I know how I'm charging it because I've already bought a, the, the, the granny, we call it a granny cable, but the, the three pin plug because I didn't have a wall box at the time, but I know that. But if I was a normal customer, this is years ago, like that's a terrible way for, like he'd made the sale. He didn't like, he was just one of those car dealers. He didn't care. Like maybe he'd got some commission or hit his target. <laughs> hey, how are you charging it? Oh my goodness. You know, you, you guys seem switched on in terms of the, the industry. You have all those dealer connections. You live in this world, Trey. Do you find there's a, an education job to do with, so it's, I know it's hard. You can't paint everybody with a good or a bad brush, but generally do we need more education? Uh, obviously, I, I, I'm sure some of our salespeople are much more interested and educated than others, but I think we try to get the product in the hands of the people that are talking to you. So, you know, uh, my dad came up with a great suggestion of, of sending our guys out. We, our infrastructure is coming along in Cincinnati and not quite there yet, um, but the main uh, fast chargers over in, uh, on the other side of town, essentially. So I sent each of my salesmen there one day and I wanted them to charge a car as a customer would. Um, it's the Electrify America charger. So they had the app, they had a phone, they needed to go over there and charge it. And some figured it out and some didn't. So it was a good way to see who was dialed in, who's not. Um, along the lines, our, our manufacturers do a great job of training us, especially on new model launches and doing continuing education. Uh, each of our salespeople, depending on the brand, have to be certified to a level uh, of passing a, a test with an instructor sitting right in front of them uh, on a on a monthly quarterly basis. So we we will have a number of different things available for for our our staff to to relate to customers and when to bring that up in the process. Uh, but again, you know, those are the type of things that like right now I'm asking, you know, please 
if, if there's something that you had a bad experience buying an EV sometime, I, I'd love to, I'd love to learn. I, I mean, you know, that's, that's going to be one of the things that keeps people coming back to us. And we, we think that we're ahead of the curve, but we can always, always, always learn more. Yeah. I love that we have this forum here of, of, of 30 plus people who are interested enough to give up their hour uh, to, to, to talk and listen about EVs as well. And so please in the comments as well, like chip in with, with, or in the chat with what you think about what we're saying. Cause um, I, I really want to learn what you, what you think. And, and, you know, I sit here in this, <laughs> this bubble, this room, um, making a kind of a podcast every day and writing about electric cars and, and the chance to reach out to you and have this conversation is amazing. Um, Steven says, do you offer extended test drives to allow a customer to decide if an EV will fit into their lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I think EVs, if you haven't had an EV and you don't know how you're gonna get around or what it's gonna be like, a lot of our manufacturers have, have talked to about the extended test drive and whatnot. So, I mean, it, we haven't had a lot of people ask for it, but it is something that, you know, we do a lot of test drives and depending on the, the brand model and availability of the model, if we have 30 people waiting in line to drive a car, it's, it's not necessarily feasible, but it, you know, they, they can be available. We also have them sprinkled into our, our service loaner fleet. So it is something that customers that may not be interested in getting an EV uh, would be interested, you know, will drive it for a day or two while their car gets serviced and, and learn a little bit more about it. Uh, Doug reckons, uh, Doug says, sorry, how do the actual manufacturers themselves support you? Because you are the conduit between the customer and the manufacturer. What are they doing to help you? Are they doing anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think our manufacturer partners do a, do a, a nice job. Like I said, the, the training is really helpful. Um, some launches of the vehicles have gone better than others. Um, I think, you know, it obviously Tesla is its own thing. And uh, it's similar to the Prius craze of the early 2000s. I mean, I think you see just a natural, you know, magnetism towards the celebrity of, of Tesla. So you know, we're getting great information. We're, we're getting great cars. And I think that's, that's really what it's going to boil down to. You know, I, I think they're now offering or asking for our input on, on launches of vehicles. And I think, you know, tailoring programs to certain markets uh, to increase the number of EVs on the road is one of the other ways that they're helping us. So they're not ungodly expensive to get into. They're, they're a lot more affordable for, for a lot of other people. I can see uh, on, this, on the screen, uh, Clinton, who I follow on Twitter and has always got something interesting to say about EVs. Do you want, have you got something that you want to add to the conversation if you want to come off mute and, and, and chip in? Thank you, very, thank you very much, Martin. I do. Um, first of all, uh, I'm an advocate of EVs and I, I hear what you're saying that the manufacturers are, are coming to you to sort of try to tailor programs for different geographical regions. I mean, what I would like to, to see more of, quite honestly, is I think the hybrid discussion, um, I'm not a big fan of it. And the reason I'm not, and, and I'm hoping that you can communicate that to the various uh, legacy automakers, is, and I'll just use two vehicles as an example. If we look at the Chevrolet Bolt, which is no longer being manufactured, uh, it had a range uh, on, on electric, uh, around 53 miles, which is about 85 kilometers. And the uh, Toyota Prius Prime uh, plug-in, not the self-charging hybrid, but the, the real hybrid, um, it uh, had a, a range of 25 miles or 40 kilometers. So I'm prefacing that my question with that information because I feel that the legacy automakers have done a terrible job when it comes to hybrids. Uh, I feel that with the exception of Toyota, uh, specifically the Prius Prime and the Chevrolet Volt, uh, that there's not much in the way of range with many hybrids. Like I consider, for me personally, when someone talks about uh, 15 or 20 miles, um, for most people who live in Canada, you know, who travel let's say 20 to 25 kilometers one way to get to work and 25 kilometers to return home, assuming they don't stop at the grocery store, it's really not adequate. And, uh, and so I'm hoping you can communicate to, you know, to the people that, that you talk to 
that look, you need to do a better job with the hybrids. And the reason it's important is because if we can get more of the public to transition from uh, fossil fuels to a, a plug-in hybrid and show them the real benefits of electricity, it will make it much easier to get them to shift to, you know, an e-tron or a Tesla or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, a Lucid Air or, you know, whatever car we're talking about. So I just curious what your thoughts are on, on my perceptions of hybrids. Uh, you're not wrong. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it's been a benefit to buying a, a gas powered vehicle for a number of years. Um, but I, I do think that's the idea is the, the first initial dipping of the toe, if you will. I mean, you know, there are a number of years that people are still driving horses on the roads when the first cars were going around. I mean, it's going to take time. And, you know, with the charging infrastructure, it's not there, at least around here or available to all people outside of Tesla or whatever for customers to just completely be ripped off of gasoline. It, it's it, it's going to take a number of years to build it out and multi, multi billions of dollars. And I think this is a good way to get people into it. And I think if you have the ability to drive uh, a shorter distance on a daily basis um, or, you know, or not have a third car, I, I find that the plug-in hybrid is a, a really nice way to try to reduce your footprint as much as you possibly can afford or to stand it or, or whatever you will. I, I do think that obviously more could be done. Um, you know, I, I also think that hydrogen fuel cell is a much better alternative than gasoline. So I'd love to see that be developed, you know, in conjunction with the electric range, but it, it's just not, not there yet. So they can't pull back completely. What they can do is what like Volvo is doing now where, you know, they are, they are lowering the prices of the plug-in hybrid cars to make it enticing for customers to go up to that car versus buying just a pure gasoline vehicle. But just a follow up, you know, what I, what I'm hoping that, that you and, and your colleagues can do within um, within sort of the, the greater dealer sales industry is to communicate to the, the legacy automakers that they need to improve the range on the hybrids because the, the range from my perspective is just, it's a little too low for wide scale adoption unless you are uh, an urban city dweller where everything is within, you know, five or 10 kilometers of where you live. Mm. And Clinton, I wouldn't say that's the case for here. Sorry. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, you're in Canada, right, Clinton? Yes. Well, that's where a plug-in hybrid can work really well because you can do a, an electric powertrain on the rear wheels. Uh, your combustion car uh, engine can drive the front wheels. You've got a four-wheel drive car that's great in bad weather, and you've got an all-wheel drive car thanks to plug-in hybrid. Um, where you say it's not so good is that it's also really cold where you are, and that's where batteries, uh, batteries do suffer. Um, sorry, Trey. Yeah, no, carry on. No, no. I, I mean, you said it better than me. I mean, I think, you know, it's going to work for some people better than it is for others. And, you know, right now when you have some, some of the communities when you're outside of Cincinnati, you know, you're a number of miles away from an electric charger. And, and going, doing a 30 mile jog down to the thing or a 80 mile jog, you know, you lose a lot of electricity very quickly. So it, it isn't something that works for everyone right now mm. until battery technology gets better, but we're, yeah. we're just not hundred percent there, but we can definitely, you know, we're, we're always advocating for better product. Like right now, the world is, is battery supply constrained. And so one of the things about plug-in hybrids is that you know, what do you do? Do you take, uh, so, so the news this week was that the Lucid Air is going to do 517 miles. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. Is it too much? Like, is that too much range? Have we actually got to the point in, in, in already when we're saying, hang on a minute, <laughs> like that's too much because you can have a smaller battery. Like what is enough? Is it 300, 400, 500 miles? It's 800 plus, 800, 830 kilometers in the Lucid Air. Okay. So that's not when it's cold or et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of being battery constrained as a planet, what do you do? Do you make one car with a 100 kilowatt hour battery or five plug-in hybrids with a 20 kilowatt hour battery? And then you've got five people driving on electric pretty much five days a week if they're doing a commute and maybe one long journey at the week. And that would be Toyota's argument is actually, look, it's better for everyone if we just make more hybrids. And so, I mean, I've called that a cop-out argument in the past, but that's just because 
uh, I can say that from the safety of, of my bubble, is actually, but if I'm you know, being serious on this call, it's actually, it is a valid argument. Now, okay, they might just be saying that as a business because they haven't got access to enough batteries yet. And when they do, maybe they'll sing the praises of, of full battery electric vehicles. It, it is a nuanced argument. Uh, David Donnelly in the comments says, any thoughts on Mac E or Nissan Aria? Um, if I can take that, uh, Mac E, fantastic. They've done it seriously and they did it quickly. Uh, Nissan Aria, make it now. There's nothing to stop Nissan making the Aria now. Why is that scheduled for late next year? Uh, it's not like it's got magical specs. It's, it's got really solid specs um, on the Nissan Aria. They've got the people. They've got the technology. That car should be, they should, they, they should have done a, you know, I like, I like Apple keynotes where they go, here's our brand new shiny thing and you can buy it now. And you go to the Apple store and the web page is updated. That's what Nissan should have done to say, here's our car. And it's 18 months away crazy and you know and th the same uh, with the cadillac as well uh, the, the lyric announced recently uh, they announced a really solid 2020 ev there uh, and it's 18 months away i think that's crazy uh they're just missing an opportunity they're missing sales and and they're just they're playing catch up super super quickly uh, there's also having... a question in there from uh, gary heaton about the toyota rav4 prime when that will be available here locally i don't know if you guys have some perspective on that uh, I, I believe it should be here by the end of the year. I mean, no, unfortunately, the first year production is, is pretty constrained. So you should see a few of them trickle into the market. Uh, I think the new models reach end of September, maybe maybe early October, just on some delays. But it's uh, it's going to be a great car. I mean, literally every every phone call we've had with Toyota, they've they've talked about the incredible demand that they're seeing uh, it, you know, coming from customers through the dealers back to them. So, and we're seeing as well, it's, it, it's going to be awesome. So it should be, should be coming soon. So if you, if you want some more information, Gary, please reach out to me. Happy to, happy to help. In the, uh, in the comments, can I take, uh, or can I, can we ask Shirley's comment? Because I, I feel like we're beating up on Trey today. Uh, but Shirley said, buying an EV online avoided the uncomfortable feeling where one person passed me to the next sales guy, who passed me to the finance guy, who passed me to the next person. Um, yeah, like Shirley, you remind me of like the last time we we got car finance and that's it's not been a while touch, touch wood we're, we've, we've been super lucky and mostly i've bought old secondhand cars or gone to the auction so you know we don't buy fancy cars with cash um but the last time i had to get finance like the sales guy was doing the thing of uh oh, oh, oh I, I really want to get you this deal but i'm just going to go back into the office and check with my boss and i'm like oh come on this is this is like a sales routine from the 1970s and he just went back there for a chat and came out and like, i tried really hard for you mate and i'm like I'm walking out of here because you're treating me like a mug. This is whenever this was, like 10 years ago now. And I'm like, I'm feeling icky. And Shirley says, what can you do as, as, a, as an industry of dealers to stop people feeling icky? That's a really good word. And I think maybe unfairly, some people are painted with that brush. But I say, I feel like we're beating up on you. But, you know, no, it's, no, it's kind of the truth. Some people see, see it that way. No, and, and you know what? I, I think the industry has earned it. But you know, it's not fun for us either. Let's say that. So we don't want to do that. We, we would prefer to give you our best price, the first price and, you know, not have you go to 10 other people that are going to give you one more dollar off than we are. It, it just makes for a really contentious transaction in general. Like I said before, I mean, there's so much information available to consumers today that you can make an informed decision on a car price, you know, if it's a good deal or not, and, and check out the incentives for yourself and what you qualify for. And a lot of times with financing, if you do go that route or leasing, you know, there are incredibly competitive rates. We shop a number of different banks on your behalf. A lot of times if you bring financing, we can even get a better rate from the same bank. So it, it's one of those things that, that it, it's, it's an incredible machine to take a car and then look at a 45 page book of incentives and rates and whatnot and figure out exactly what the monthly payment is. But I promise you now online, we can do it with the push of a button. So we'd love to, to take your 100% online and make it as close to that reality as possible. So that's, that's where, where we come in as a dealer group and, and you know, eventually an industry, but I, I think that we can, we can really take a lot of the stress out of it 
you just need to be com communicating with us up front. I mean, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to feel. This is what I want. And we want to deliver that price. And we, we actually have a website that's like no haggle, uh, no haggle pricing.com. So we've, we've, <laughs> believe me, like I said, my dad is the antithesis of a car guy. So we do not want to make people feel uncomfortable. We, we want to be upfront, transparent. Our cars are priced to market and, and, we're trying to give you the best deal we possibly can by still making a viable business. Thanks, uh, you know, to the question earlier. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, there's a comment from uh, Doug that I saw earlier um, about this. This is going to be like a tipping point or a line in the sand where the good businesses survive and thrive, and the bad ones that deserve to go out of business or have less business, it will probably. This is probably going to be a, a moment. So the car that we bought that we've had for a year now. Um, and we bought that new and it sits the other side of that wall just behind me. Um, an amazing experience because I love being sold to by a great salesperson. Like when it's, when it's a good experience and it's not icky, I love, I love dealing with someone who, as you just said, ask me what I want. I love being sold to. I mean, I've never been a salesperson. I think I'm a frustrated salesperson because I love that process. And, you know, he emailed me everything up front. All the documents that I had to sign were PDFs. So uh, I printed them all out on my printer at home. I signed them all. So literally when I went to pick my car up and it, it, he said, I'll deliver it if you want and, and just hand the, uh, the paperwork over. But I wanted to go in and see him because he seemed like a nice guy. And we went in and I had everything printed. I had everything signed. Uh, and then there was just a couple more things that he had on his iPad. He just lifted up his iPad and, and I, I, I digitally signed it. And he gave me the keys and it took seconds. And so that was an amazing sales experience from a dealership who I've recommended probably tens of times to my listeners have said, who do you recommend I get a so-and-so from? And I've recommended this guy because it was an amazing experience. Um, I know yeah, we've got five, that, five, sorry, carry on. Oh, sorry. That's what we, that's what we strive for. I mean, you know, the funny thing, I, just to throw a stat out there and obviously it may be different with this community or whatnot, but you know, from, from what we see in an industry, 70% of the people give or take a few percentages that walk into a car uh, dealership have something in mind and they end up buying something completely different. So they come in on one single car, one stock number, one VIN number, and they end up taking something completely different. Now, whether that's car, option, spec, color, whatever, it's it's a big statistic. So buying things online like that, you know, it's it's definitely another justification for, for our existence, let's say. Just got a few minutes left, and I'm gonna throw this out to both of you guys. What can we do? And uh, Trey, this has been great to hear how um, how EV ready you guys are and what you do to make the experience so much better for um, the buyers or the potential buyers. What can we do to get more dealerships to be ready to sell to this new wave of EV uh, buyers? And I throw that out to both of you. I don't know if that's something that's different in just the markets relative to the U.S., or if dealers around the globe are kind of doing something really different to bring to, to make that experience for EV buyers that much better. Uh, in Cincinnati, nothing. Don't worry about it. Don't tell them anything. You know, we'll we'll be fine. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we we obviously need to learn. But similar to what I said, I mean, we don't know what we don't know. Um, obviously, our inventory and the building of the cars is based on demand. So if you have demand for these cars, if you want to buy these cars, if you want to test drive these cars, go do it. it we don't know what we don't know. So sitting online and you know looking at Googling pictures and doing whatever, that doesn't necessarily help us or Audi or Porsche or Toyota make one more car. Um, but, but if you come in and you buy one or you think you want one and we get down the funnel and it's not right, that still is something that says someone is interested in this car to us. Maybe we should get another one, you know, and we sell it to somebody else and we get another one back. So come out, talk to us, but don't do it, do it in a way that we can tally it and show the manufacturers to keep making more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just this, this process of the last hour has, has given me the idea that maybe I need to be, I don't know, putting together some sort of training course to offer out to the market because just t just telling you about my experience has got my cogs whirring and thinking, you know, what really should have happened is 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 that person selling me that car should have said, 
here's a range of charges, you know, on pedestals in the showroom and said, look, here's one that will show that the, you, there's an app for, and here's how the app works. And here's one that's a bit more of a dumb charger, but it's half the price. And you can't, you know, <laughs> when you're out and about, you can't see what you, so, but if you, but if you want, and here's like the deluxe model of the charger and, uh, and they could have added, they could have added easily a very good margin to that. And they said, and we've got the a local electrician or we've got our guy or girl, and they'll and they'll do all the paperwork, and they could have easily earned some extra commission on that, or just a bit of extra margin by making it really easy. Uh, they haven't, you know. I don't want a lecture from car dealers on this is a Chatamo plug, this is a CCS plug, but right. I do want a level of asking questions to know where I am in in that. And if I'm genuinely walking into a dealership and I don't know anything, it would be great to be pointed towards a resource to say, look. Mm -hmm. There's three or four different plugs, depending on where you are in the world. And actually, we can tell you about it. Or here's, you know, wouldn't it be so cool if like a dealership had done their own little mini YouTube series uh, featuring their staff uh, so that there's that, uh, you know, hey, here's this and here's this. And, mm -hmm. and if I knew that already, I haven't got to learn that bit. So there's, there's a big education job to do. And I yeah. think that applies in Europe. I'll stop talking. I want to be respectful of your time for everyone watching, but um, uh, as, as, as much as here as anywhere in the world. I think very, very true. And I also think that there's an education job on both ends, right? There's not only the dealership, but I think we need to do an awful lot in terms of educating the public. I think this is why this is so important, these kinds of um, activities and events and why, a little plug for EV Cincy, why it's really important for, I, I think, for local governments to really educate um, their residents and, public, uh, and the public on some things like this. Um, we are at time, you guys, and this has been super fantastic. Um, for me, I'm a big fan of EV News Daily. I've gotten to know Trey over the last couple of months of putting this together, and you guys have been a blast um, to, to, to join us and kind of chat with um, the audience about where we are with EVs, and in particular, where the dealership um, weighs in on this. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. We're gonna send this um, uh, a link out to you uh, later on with a copy of the recording if you'd like, as well as some resources where you can find out a little bit more about EV Sensi. Uh, thanks again, Martin. Thanks again, Trey, for all of your help. You guys have a Thank wonderful, you, Carla. wonderful Thursday thanks, afternoon. You're welcome. This was great. Thank have you for everything. Everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. This is when I would do music, but I don't have music. <laughs> <laughs> Carla, thank you. This was awesome. Oh, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I'm so glad. This was great. We heard so much about um, what you guys are doing out there. You're a total model for other dealerships, <laughs> seriously. We're trying. We're trying here. So, so it's a learning <laughs> process, and we're not there yet. But thanks. Thanks for including